Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have The Fire. This is a photo that comes to us from 2003 at the Station nightclub in Rhode Island, and it shows the band Great White as they perform. While this seems like just a regular photo that someone took on their Motorola Razor, what ensued shortly after this photo was taken is absolutely tragic. Basically, as the band performed, there were some pyrotechnics that were set off, and while this was meant to be a spectacular display, it only ended up in disaster. The fireworks ended up setting all of the flammable acoustic foam in the walls and ceiling on fire, and within one minute, everything that was combustible was up in flames. Within two minutes, the entire club was fully engulfed in black smoke, and people were having trouble finding exits. In the end, this fire took the lives of 100 people, and another 230 were injured as a result. It has gone down in US history as one of the worst and most deadly nightclub fires. In our number nine spot today, we have The Core. This photo shows a physicist named Harold Agnew, and while this looks like a relatively normal, non-threatening photo, what he has in his his hand is truly devastating. Harold is holding the nuclear core of what was nicknamed the Fat Man Atomic Bomb. This means that Harold is holding the nuclear core of the atomic bomb that was later dropped on Nagasaki in 1945. The immediate blast of course took many lives, but so did the long term effects of the bomb like radiation illnesses and that sort of thing. It's crazy to look at a photo like this because it seems so perfectly normal when he literally has a life changing world ending device in the palm of his hand. Also, I don't I don't think I could ever hold something like that. Not only would I just not want to, but I don't think I could even get near it for fear of something going wrong. In our number eight spot today, we have the eruption. This is a photo that is showing Mount Pinatubo, which is located in the Philippines on June 15th, 1991. That is the day that this volcano erupted into what would be the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. Certainly impressive, also extremely terrifying. This photo shows the pyroclastic flow full of hot gas and rock being flung into the air. Eruptive activity in the volcano first started on April 2nd of that year, which prompted researchers to set up seismographs in the area. By June, the volcano was having a group of progressively shallower eruptions before, on June 12th, the volcano had its first spectacular eruption, which sent an ash column 19 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Additional smaller explosions continued on June 13th, which then led to some intense seismic activity. After more highly gas-charged magma reached the surface, on June 15th, the volcano once again exploded, this time sending the cloud of ash 40 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Volcanic ash and pumice blanketed the surrounding areas, and pyroclastic flows filled what were once deep valleys with fresh volcanic deposits. It is truly magnificent and extremely powerful, and this photo shows just that. In our number 7 spot today, we have post-war. This is a photo that is said to have been taken in 1946, just after the end of the Second World War. Story goes that the person in this photo is a soldier who had just returned home from war, which would already be difficult and challenging enough, but as he returned home, he came to hear the news that unfortunately, despite his survival, his family had lost their lives during the war. There is no doubt about the impact that either world war had on the world, and how the impact doesn't stop once the war is over. These wars changed the course of history, and they changed people's lives forever. This is definitely a difficult photo to look at, and it's an eerie reminder of those dark times. In our number 6 spot today we have All Hallows Eve. In this day and age when Halloween time comes around, we see all types of costumes. We see a few spooky scary ones, but for the most part we see princesses or fairies or basketball players or some sort of pop culture reference, but back in the day, Halloween was a terrifying time. I'm not saying that because people dressed as all these elaborate scary creatures, I just mean that the absolute scraps people would throw together to make a Halloween mask are truly scarier than any creature I could come up with. This photo just shows a nice little family as they're ready to celebrate the spookiest day of the year, and oh my gosh, it is actually terrifying. Like, I feel like I'm looking at a still from the movie Strangers or something. It looks so terrifying, but it's likely just a completely harmless and innocent celebration. Honestly, while I'm kind of over seeing people show up to Halloween parties as cats, I'll take that over a potato sack any day, apparently. In our number 5 spot today, we have The Experiment. This is a photo that comes from some experiments that were being conducted from the French neurologist Duchenne de Bologna. He was best known for his use of photographs during his experiments, as evidenced by, well, 
this video. He was also known for his research into the use of electrical stimulation of muscles, and of course, these photos really help to capture exactly that. These photos have gone down in history, not even necessarily for what they show medically, but just because of how startling they are and the often grotesque facial expressions seen on the patient. The experiment being conducted in this shot was meant to determine how exactly the muscles in the face produce facial expressions, which he believed at the time were directly linked to the soul of a man. Of course, these strange faces the patient is making are due to the electrical stimulation, but the photos from his experiments truly make it look like the patients are going through some kind of torment or torture. As far as I know, the man in this photo was totally fine both before and after the experiment, despite what it may appear as, which is always what we want to hear. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Spectre. This is a photo that was taken in England in 1963, and it became known as the Spectre of the Newby Church. That, of course, is because of the ghostly figure that can be seen in this photo. I'm always a little suspicious of ghost photos. Some are certainly more convincing than others, but Photoshop in 1963 wasn't exactly as accessible and easy as it is now. The photo is said to have been taken by Reverend K.F. Lord inside of the Newby Church, which is located in North Yorkshire, England. Of course, I mean like many of us are going to do, people were really skeptical of this apparition and just believed that it was a well done case of double exposure, which to be fair is entirely possible. Possible. The reverend continued to swear up and down, however, that the photo was not doctored. So at this point, there's no proof to prove either side, and it's just a game of he said, she said. So what do you guys think? Apparition caught slipping, or is the reverend making it up? In our number three spot today, we have the eruption of Mount St. Helens. Mount St. Helens is a stratovolcano located in Skamania County, Washington. The volcano is best known for its huge and disastrous eruption on May 18th, 1980. This photograph comes from the photographer. Robert Landsberg, who of course was in the area at the time of the eruption. Before the eruption, he had visited the area in order to photograph and document all of the changes that were happening. On May 18th, he was within a few miles of the volcano when it erupted. Since he unfortunately was so close to the explosion, he knew he would be unable to escape this disaster, so instead of focusing on the impossible, he focused on taking as many pictures as possible. Robert was obviously incredibly brave and dedicated, but he was also very smart. After snapping as many photos as he could, including this one, he then secured his camera in his backpack and covered his backpack with his body. He knew he was unlikely to survive, but he wanted to make sure that these photos did. His body was found 17 days later with his backpack still underneath him. His film was of course developed and has provided geologists with some really valuable insights with his close documentation of the eruption. In our number 2 spot today, we have the Boneyard. This is a photo that comes from what is called a Boneyard. Basically, the photo was taken during a time when it was normal for overcrowded cemeteries to dig up skeletons after five years if the family didn't continue to pay for them to stay buried. Yeah. It's not a great rule, but it happened and it's a part of our weird dark history. This particular photo comes from near the Colon Cemetery in Cuba and it shows what they did with these dug up bones. They put them in this boneyard that eventually grew to be 30 feet deep. That is so creepy. This photo shows how the area became a popular tourist destination and this photo is said to have been taken after the Spanish American War and it shows two American soldiers playing with bones. Maybe not the best idea, I mean a little respect for those who past might be in order. It definitely is an eerie sight to behold. In our number one spot today, we have the crypt. This is a photo that comes to us from the early 1900s, and it shows the area that is beneath the church of Santa Maria della Concezione di Cappuccini, which is located in Rome, Italy. This area is known as the Capuchin Crypt, and it is a little eerie to say the least. That is because the walls are lined with skeletal remains. It is said that on the walls, there are the remains of 3,700 bodies believed to be the Catholic friars who were buried by their order. It is definitely terrifying to look at and it seems a little nightmare inducing, but the Catholic order insists it isn't meant to be so macabre. They explain that it's actually meant to be a silent reminder of the swift passage of life on earth and our own mortality. Well. I can say it definitely does that. Starting off this countdown, we have the plot to kill. This photo was taken of Thomas Bart Whittaker on the left and his younger brother Kevin on the right, just hours before Thomas planned to have his family killed. So apparently the two brothers were just goofing off and their mother wanted to take a photo of them. Then later, they went out for dinner as like a little celebration for Thomas completing his exams, which was a lie. Anyways, while they were at the restaurant, Thomas had his friend enter his home and retrieve a gun and stage 
stage of burglary. He then waited at the front door for Thomas's family to return home. Once they did, he shot Thomas's mom and brother. His dad managed to survive. The photo shows Thomas's happy younger brother, but little did he know that his older brother literally had a plot to kill him. It's so disturbing. In our ninth spot, we have Victor Barrio. But before we go any further, if you guys are liking this video, make sure to give it a big thumbs up and of course, subscribe to our channel. Come on guys, it really helps us out, so hit that button, subscribe, ring that little bell. Victor Barrio was a 29 year old Spanish bullfighter. Sadly, on July 9th, 2016, his bullfighting days came to an end when a 529 kilogram bull's horn pierced through his chest. This moment was captured in front of a live audience and also was broadcasted on live TV. Some people managed to get photos as this happened and it's horrifying. You can see the look of pain on his face as the bull's horn just plunges through him. Like I feel so bad for him and for all the people that had to witness it. It's so scary. In our eighth spot we have the Panama Hikers. Chris Kremers and Lizanne Froon were two young Dutch females that saved up to take a trip to Panama. Except while on a hike in the Panamanian jungle, the two disappeared. It wasn't until months later that their bodies were found, but it's still unclear how the two died. The last photos taken of them were in April of 2014 the day that they went on the hike. They are selfies of the girls looking very excited to be on the trip. These photos were found on their camera, which was found in a backpack along the banks of a river. The camera also contained other pictures, like of the jungle in the dead of night. Maybe they were using the camera's flash as a source of light. Another photo showed the back of Chris's head and it was bleeding. Again, it's so scary looking at these photos. Like these poor young girls had no clue what was about to happen to them and they were so excited for their trip. Coming and at number seven, we have the drowning. On October 22nd, 2003, Tina Watson and her husband, David Gabriel, went out scuba diving on their honeymoon. They just got married 11 days earlier, and scuba diving was part of their honeymoon itinerary. Now, in this photo, if you look right at the back, you can see a diver laying on the seafloor. That's Tina Watson. A few minutes before this photo was taken, it's believed that her husband turned off her air supply and held her underwater until she drowned. Then he swam up to the surface to alert other divers that she was in trouble. The photo was captured accidentally and you can see the divers going to help Tina. Some say he held her underwater until she drowned. Others say he saw her struggling as a new scuba diver and just kind of left her there to die on her own. Either way, he pleaded guilty to manslaughter and that was the last photo ever taken of her. In our number six spot today, we have the disguise. Speaking of the second world war, as it began to come to a close, many of the Germans who were involved in all of the many, many violations of human rights began to flee or try and hide or disguise themselves for fear of being persecuted. One of those was, of course, the worst of them all, Hitler himself. This photo, or rather series of photos, was created by the US government as an attempt to document the many ways that he could have disguised himself in order to escape being recognized and captured. At the time, the fear of him being able to escape responsibility and go on living his life abroad was very real. I mean, there have been others who actually did did manage to do just that, and that is exactly the reason for these photos. There is also something kind of interesting and bizarre about what happens when we take away the features of his that we know him by. In the end, he didn't escape and go on to live abroad, but he did escape being held responsible before the world. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Titanic. We all know the story of the Titanic. I mean, it's one of the most famous in history, and this photo comes from just before the historic iceberg encounter. On April 10th, 1912, the Titanic set sail on its maiden voyage, heading from Southampton over to New York City. The ship took a couple of stops along the way, one in France, one in Ireland, before setting off for the United States officially, and somewhere along the beginning part of its journey, someone was able to snap a photo of the ship as it sailed. It's not clear exactly where this photo was taken, but it is thought to be the last photo taken of the ship before its tragic end. Considering it was only four days after the ship set sail that it hit the iceberg, it is likely that this photo came not too long before the terrible day. In our number 4 spot today, we have the lipstick killer. This is a photo that comes to us from December 10th, 1945. If looking at this image gives you a shudder down your spine, that absolutely makes sense, as it was written by a terrible person known as the lipstick killer. This photo is an image of a note he left written on the wall at one of his crimes.
crime scenes. The photo comes from the apartment of Francis Brown as just before he wrote this message, he took her life. After this message was left, he ended up taking the life of one other person because he was finally caught by the police six months later. The message scrawled in the photo reads, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. It is an absolutely chilling note with a horrific backstory. Coming in at number three, Blanche Monnier. Born in 1849, Blanche Monnier was a well respected French socialite from a conservative bourgeoisie family. Acclaimed for astounding beauty, by her early 20s, there were plenty of suitors who fancied her hand, and by 1876, at the age of 27, she finally found a man who she wished to marry. However, the man in question, a penniless lawyer, was not to her mother's liking. And so, in a fit of disapproval, her mother decided to lock her daughter in a tiny dark room in the attic of their home where poor Blanche remained hidden from sunlight and humanity for the next 25 years of her life. Now, beyond the obviously awful parts about this decision, her mother spent the next 25 years claiming her daughter was missing, playing the victim of a mourning mother. Meanwhile, with the help of her son and Blanche's brother Marcel, let her daughter literally rot, starve, and go mad in isolation. That was until May of 1901, when the Paris Attorney General received an anonymous letter revealing the location and depravity of Madame Monnier's prisoner. And when the police arrived, they couldn't believe their eyes. As you can see in this photo, Blanche was in an unrecognizable state, covered in rotten food, her own feces, and weighing a mere 50 pounds. Police said the stench in that room was so vile, they could barely stay long enough to get her out of there. In the end, Blanche was taken to live the rest of her life in a facility as she suffered extreme mental health disorders from the cruelties she experienced, though sadly, justice was never really served. Her mother died shortly after she was found, and her brother was acquitted as, at the time, duty to rescue was not a part of the penal code. Coming in at number two. Rings. Starting in 1933, up until the end of World War II, we are all very well aware that the evil German party operated more than a thousand camps and inflicted some of the most cruel, inhumane, and diabolical acts on millions of prisoners, especially targeting the Jewish population. Now, while this is by no means the most awful photo depicting this period in time, it does however showcase the gravity in a new light. This photo dating back to May 5th, 1945, shortly after the defeat of the dictatorship, US troops stumbled across this giant box of wedding rings prisoners were forced to remove so that the party could repurpose the high quality gold. Among these rings, they also found watches, eyeglasses, gold fillings that would have been extracted from the prisoners' teeth, and precious stones. And so while this photo may look rather innocent compared to some of the others on this list, it is in fact anything but. And last up in our number one spot, human zoos. It's no secret that humanity has done some incredibly messed up and cruel things through the years. War, genocide, slavery, to name a few. However, this photo dating back to 1904 shows yet another mind boggling atrocity. As you can see, this photo shows what used to be an actual attraction at the Coney Island Zoo in the early 20th century, imprisoned Filipino people, which is beyond disgusting. Apparently, these attractions began in the late 19th century and were very popular up until the mid 1950s as the western world was desperate to see what at the time was viewed as a primitive and savage lifestyle. I know, it's gross. This one in particular was reportedly intended to show off the fact that the US had recently claimed the Philippines and visitors would come by to watch the prisoners inside while throwing peanuts at them. Now, I should clarify, it was not just Coney Island doing this. Zoos containing captured indigenous peoples from Asian and African countries were very popular in other countries like France, England, Spain, Italy, as well as the United States. But either way, it's beyond revolting that this was a thing to begin with, let alone that it went on for so long. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Hook Island Sea Monster. Ah yes, another reason to avoid the ocean, as if our channel wasn't that already. This photo was taken back in 1964. This photo apparently is a sea monster off the coast of Hook Island. This thing is roughly 90 feet in length, so it's pretty noticeable, especially in shallow waters. A man named Robert Lesterac spotted it while he was with his family. He noticed its tail was injured, but its head 
was massive. Those are the two noticeable features. Injured tail and a big old head. It looked like a giant tadpole. But many believe it's a giant tarp, but there's not enough evidence either way. What do you guys think? Is it some sort of mythological creature or maybe a now extinct species of fish or just an optical illusion? Maybe just a shadow or a big rock. It could be a rock. Either way, avoid those shallow areas. Stingrays alone? No, no way. Catch me in a lake. Number nine, the skunk ape. This one is exactly what it sounds like. How fun. The skunk ape was seen back in 2000, so hopefully if it was a real thing, it's long gone by now. Or it's since reproduced and we're screwed. Two photos were taken of this skunk ape creature. This thing looks like Bigfoot's cooler, older cousin. You know, the cousin who has a lava lamp and does kickflips in the garage in October? That's the skunk ape compared to Bigfoot. Bigfoot's old news, get him out of here. What does he do anyways besides Guy's boring. Doesn't do any kickflips. This guy for sure. This guy haunts families, it seems. Anonymous source sent the Sarasota County Sheriff's Department these photos. They mailed them, which for starters, how jarring would that be to open 9 a.m. in the morning? But she claims these photos were taken in her backyard and that this creature was not a black bear. I don't think that's a black bear. If anything, it's a really, really large dog. Those teeth alone are a red flag, either way. Closing that door. Good night. Number eight. Phoenix Lights. Turning the calendars back to 1997, a time long before Photoshop, this photo here shows a series of unidentified aerial phenomena. It's just hovering over Phoenix, Arizona. They were bright and they stuck around for a few hours. This was also only one year after the movie Independence Day came out, so I'm sure this freaked a lot of residents out. Or maybe it's fake because of the movie. Who knows? That's why I'm here. There's many eyewitness reports of the Phoenix lights, so much so that an explanation was demanded. So the US Air Force came forward and said the lights were flares dropping during a training exercise. Yeah, just a casual training night exercise over the city of Phoenix, Arizona. Classic, we always see those. This obviously worried people and the Air Force took responsibility, yet later on in 2007 and 2008, the same lights returned over the city. The same lights returned in the same spot. Still, there has been no explanation that makes any sense. Drones, maybe, was it too soon? I don't know, drones are good. Drones are too good now. That bowling alley video of the drone whipping through, way too good. So, you never know. Number seven, pyramids on the moon. In 1972, this image was taken by Apollo 17 during its flight to the moon near an area known as Geophone Rock. NASA listed the image as blank, but after retouching the photo, you can see that it's not completely blank. Turning up the contrast, a pyramidal structure can be seen. So, what is it? Was it some malfunction of the camera, or is there actually a pyramid on the moon? NASA has never given a credible version of the issue, which has led to some speculations about what actually can be on the moon, hidden from the public. And listen, not to be a crazy conspiracy theorist, but maybe it is true that aliens built the pyramids on Earth as they looked like they did it on the moon too. I don't know, but it gives you a lot to think about. While this eye looks like it may belong to a scary monster, it's actually a human eye. While rummaging through photographs that capture the devastating impact of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this photo emerged. On the 6th and 9th of August 1945, the United States detonated two atomic for the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. The aerial bombings together ended the lives between 129,000 and 226,000 people, people most of whom were civilians. When the bomb detonated at 1,900 feet above the city center of Hiroshima, the subsequent explosion caused temperatures of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit to annihilate nearly everything within 1,600 feet of Last zone. Almost anything and anyone within a mile was destroyed. And he were so extreme that they bleached the city's exposed surfaces, except in places where an unsuspecting person shielded the building or sidewalk or bridge from the blast with their own body in their final moments alive. Now, this is what the eye of an victim plied by an atomic rack looks like. While it had been a well-known fact that radiation causes cataracts in animals, the development of atomic cataracts in human beings was noted after the atomic in Japan. Now, it wasn't just this person who suffered from this, but many others as well. Number five, the babushka lady. The woman in the brown coat, or the babushka lady as she was later called by the FBI, was very close to JFK when he was assassinated in Dallas. Traveling in a presidential motorcade through downtown Dallas, JFK was assassinated hit once in the back and once in the head. Kennedy was taken to Parkland Hospital for emergency medical treatment, where he was pronounced dead 30 minutes later. Now, Lee Harvey Oswald was charged with Kennedy's assassination, 
he denied. Oswald then was a as well soon after. These theories allege the involvement of the CIA, the Mafia, Vice President Lyndon B. Johnson, Cuban Prime Minister Federal Castro, the KGB, or some combination. Now according to eyewitnesses though, this woman, the babushka lady, filmed the entire thing. It's thought that from her vantage point, she may have been able to answer some critical questions about what really happened that day. However, the FBI was never able to track her down, and no one has since been able to figure Figure out the identity of this mystery observer. Number four, human zoos. Yes, you might have thought that zoos were strictly for animals, but once upon a time there were human zoos, which I personally find disgusting. Now, this photo was taken in 1904, where the U.S. government imported 1,300 indigenous Filipinos from different tribes to display at the St. Louis Exposition in 1904. Yeah, you heard that right. The government did this, but our we really that surprised. The zoos were public displays of people, usually in so called natural or primitive state, to be seen and gawked at. These zoos were most prominent during the 19th and 20th centuries, and in the 1870s, exhibitions of so called exotic populations became popular throughout the Western world. Human zoos could be seen in many of Europe's largest cities, such as Paris, Hamburg, London, Milan, as well as American cities such as New York City and Chicago. These people were zoo attractions among the monkeys and lizards to show off the new U.S. possessions. These people were often bound by ropes and visitors threw peanuts at them. The treatment of these human beings was just awful. Number 3. Dytlov Pass Mystery The Dytlov Pass incident was the event in which 9 Soviet trekkers passed away in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd, 1959 in uncertain circumstances. There are many theories as to what caused the tragedy, but ultimately it's a mystery. The experienced trekking group from the Yuri Polytechnic Institute was led by Igor Dyatlov. Overnight, something seemingly caused the group to cut their way out of their tent from inside and flee the campsite. While them cutting open their tent from the inside is confusing enough, the bodies found were improperly dressed for the heavy snowfall and the freezing temperatures. As the story goes on, things only get further from making sense. After the bodies were discovered, Soviet authorities determined that six had passed from hypothermia, while the other three suffered physical trauma. One had major skull damage, two severe chest trauma, and another had a small skull fracture. Four of the bodies were found lying in a creek, and three of those bodies had soft tissue damage to the head and face. Two bodies were missing eyes, one missing a tongue, and another had missing eyebrows. Now, if it had just been the hypothermia, this case would be totally different. But what the heck did all this physical damage in the middle of nowhere? While we aren't sure exactly what went down, there are lots of pictures of the group's final days as well as plenty of theories. There was a new investigation opened in 2019 calling it an avalanche, but I don't know still. Does an avalanche really remove your tongue and eyeballs? Number 2. A Miracle of the Andes On October 13, 1972, Uruguayan Air Force Flight 571, chartered by an amateur rugby team, crashed into the Andes Mountains. The wreckage of the crash was not located for more than two months. There were only 16 out of 45 who survived the whole thing, with the incident gaining international attention after after it was revealed the survivors had resorted to cannibalism. Due to the bad weather, the pilot of the plane misjudged their location and the plane ended up striking a mountain, losing both wings before crashing into a remote valley of Argentina, near the Chilean border. A search party was sent out, but due to the white plane on the white snow, it was unable to be spotted from above. After eight days, the search was called off, thinking there were no survivors, though later rescue efforts were taken over by family. There were initially 33 survivors, but due to the elements, injuries, and an avalanche, the numbers were shrinking. Several survivors surveyed the area for an escape route. On December 12th, almost exactly two months since the crash, three men set out to go find help. Though one did return to the crash site after a difficult trek, the other two men finally came across some people. It was December 20th now, and the people they found alerted the authorities. On December 22nd, six survivors were flown to safety, but bad weather meant the remaining eight waited and until the 23rd. There are photos from both before the crash of the group. There are photos from both before the crash of the group on the plane and 
after of the group surrounding the fallen plane, as well as books and a movie about the incident. And at number one, a solo hike. In 2014, two women, Chris Kremers and Lisanne Froon, were visiting Panama from the Netherlands, and on April 1st, they went on a walk through the scenic forest near the Baru volcano, only to never return. Alarm was raised the day after they didn't return from their hike, and a search party was sent out right away, only to find no sign of Kremers or Froon. A while later, a local woman found Froon's backpack. In the bag, they found her camera, two pairs of sunglasses, some cash, her passport, a water bottle, two bras, and both the women's phones. Probably the most concerning they found were the final images taken on the camera. All of the photos from April 1st are just the two women exploring the jungle. Then there are no pictures until April 8th, when 90 unsettling pictures were taken with the flash in the middle of the jungle, timestamped between 1 and 4 a.m. Most of these images are of complete darkness and the jungle floor, but there are two very alarming pics. One shows some of the women's belongings on a rock, and the other looks like the back of Kremer's head with what appears to be blood stain in her hair. Something else suspicious about the camera is that image 509 was missing, with 508 being the last of them looking okay, and image 510 being the first in the darkness days later. They found a pelvic bone and a foot still inside a boot. Froon's bones appeared to decompose naturally, but Kremer seemed to be stark white as if they'd been bleached, further leading to question if someone else was involved. At number 10, parkour gone wrong. I'm sure you've all seen an example of parkour before, but I would personally describe it as people launching themselves from one spot to the next, avoiding injury by the skin of their teeth. Often done outdoors, some of the maneuvers these people do are seemingly impossible. While it takes a lot of practice and coordination, this sport can also be super dangerous. Parkour daredevils like to take things quite literally to the next level, and as heights get higher and tricks get more technical, disasters not far behind. Pavel Kashin was a Russian parkour artist who unfortunately learned his lesson the hard way. In 2013, he was performing a stunt on the rooftop of a 16 story building with a friend filming. They ended up capturing the final moments of Kashin's life. He was one of the well known parkour artists or freerunners, being named one of the best in the world. He was known for his breakthrough stunts, which you can still find videos of today. On the day of his passing, Kashin was standing on a three foot wide ledge on the top of an apartment building. The daredevil decided to do a backflip on this very small ledge, with him completing the trick only to lose his footing on the landing and be sent over the edge. Kashin's fans and fellow members of the parkour community showed their support and sent respects to his family. His friends uploaded the final image of Pavel mid-flip with the permission of his parents to the web. Kashin's parents hoped that the image would deter others from doing the same as their son. Number 9. Wind Turbine Fire If you've ever seen a wind turbine in real life before, you will know just how massive the energy Energy converting monsters actually are. In October 2013, two workers were doing routine maintenance to a 67 meter high turbine in Oltensplat, Netherlands. Don't come for me, I know I butchered that name, but while they were doing this maintenance, a fire broke out quickly engulfing the only escape route, trapping the workers high above the ground. Due to the height of the fire, the firefighters had a hard time reaching the fire to put it out, so a specialized crew of firefighters were called in with a large crane. Unfortunately, this took hours, which the technicians did not have. In their last moments, a photo of the tragedy was snapped, and in it you can see the turbine in a blaze, but you can also see the two workers embracing in their final moments. The image just amplifies how big the turbine actually is and shows how hopeless a rescue mission would have been. The men were just 19 and 21 at the time. One tried one last effort to survive, with one man jumping from the wind turbine in the last effort to save himself, and the other tried to scale down the side, only to be caught up in the blaze. The man who jumped was found in a field next to the turbine, and the other was found when firefighters were able to finally climb to the turbine. The cause of the fire is unknown, but believed to be a short circuit. While this free accident ended up taking two lives, the tragedy led to a political inquiry into safety precautions for wind turbine maintenance crews. Their final photo together was sad, but it was nice that in their final moments they did have each other. Number 8. Racing to Disaster Gary Box was one of the many firefighters who was there on 9-11 risking it all in order to save lives. Unfortunately, he was also one of the many who never made it home after that day. 
hours before heroically losing his life, Box was photographed racing towards the disaster. The image was taken in the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel by a pedestrian in their car. Their engine got stuck in the traffic of the tunnel, so in full gear carrying as much as they could, Box and the rest of his crew started running on foot to ground zero. Gary was 35 at the time and his remains were never recovered. All images taken that day I'm sure have something haunting about them, but knowing how little time he had left is another level. Number 7 George Mallory and Sandy Irvine On June 8, 1924, British mountaineers George Mallory and Andrew Sandy Irvine went missing on Mount Everest during their attempt to uh, reach the summit. Mallory and Irvine were part of the British 1924 Mount Everest expedition led by General Charles Bruce. The pair were last seen by their fellow climber Noel Odell at an elevation of around 28,000 feet on the northeast ridge of the mountain. The weather on Everest that day was unstable, very overcast with snow making for low visibility. After Mallory and Irvine failed to return to their camp, search parties were sent out, but no trace of them was found. Several expeditions in the following years attempted to locate Mallory and Irvine's remains and their camera, hoping to find clues about whether they reached the summit, but it wasn't until 1999 that Mallory's body was discovered on the north face of the mountain. The last photo snapped of them was taken by Noel Odell right before they began their ascent. Japan Airlines Flight 123, a Boeing 747, crashed on August 12th of 1985, taking the lives of 520 of the 524 people on board. The crash was caused by severe structural failure, which led to a rapid decompression and loss of control. The last photo recovered from the crash site was taken by one of the passengers on the flight. In the photo, passengers can be seen wearing oxygen masks. The accident was caused by the rupture of the aircraft's rear pressure bulkhead, which separated the pressurized cabin from the unpressurized tail section. The bulkhead had been improperly repaired after a tail strike incident seven years earlier. And the failure of the rear pressure bulkhead led to a sudden and explosive decompression inside the cabin. Decompression caused damage to control cables and systems, making it almost impossible for the pilots to maintain control of the plane. The craft eventually entered a rapid descent and crashed into a mountain range. There were actually more than four passengers who survived the initial crash, but they died after several hours waiting to be rescued. Japan Airlines Flight 123 crash is one of the deadliest single aircraft accidents in aviation history. Number 5. Snake Man This is the last photo taken of Ali Khan Samsudin. He was known as the Snake King after he spent 12 hours a day for 40 days living with 400 cobras in a small room. He also stayed in a small glass enclosure with 6,000 scorpions for 21 days, earning him the title Scorpion King. His 2006 performance in Kuala Lumpur would sadly be his last though. During his show, he was bitten by a king cobra, one of the deadliest snakes in the world with venom powerful enough to take down a full-sized elephant in a matter of hours. Samsudin had been bitten before. He'd even suffered a couple cobra bites before and made it out alive, but this time he didn't recover. His condition just got worse and worse, and the Snake King died in the hospital three days later. Next, we have the last photo of Mayinga Naseka. Mayinga Naseka was a nurse in Zari, now uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, during the 1976 Ebola outbreak. She contracted the Ebola virus while treating patients at Mambalad Hospital in Kinshasa. She caught the virus while treating a nun who had been flown in from Yambuku Mission hospital where the initial outbreak began. Nasaka's case became widely known as she was one of the earliest identified healthcare workers to be infected during the outbreak. And in this photo, you see her standing with another nurse tending to a patient. She died just a few days after this picture was taken. The nurses weren't given the proper protective equipment and there hadn't been any proper precautions taken to prevent contact with the nun's blood or fluids because at the time, it wasn't known just how deadly the virus really was. Next up, we have the 1961 U.S. figure skating team. This is the last photo of the U.S. figure skating team, which was taken at the airport shortly before they boarded Sabina Flight 548. In the photo, team members appeared in high spirits, smiling, posing for the camera. Little did they know that this would be the last moment captured before the tragic event that claimed their lives. On February 15th of 1961, Sabina Flight 548 
a Boeing 707 aircraft crashed while attempting to land at Brussels Airport in Belgium. The plane was carrying the entire team along with coaches, officials, and other passengers. The crash resulted in the tragic loss of 72 people on board. The cause of the crash never been 100% determined, but the most likely cause was a failure in the plane's flap system combined with poor weather conditions. The pilot struggled to maintain control during the landing attempt, leading to the deadly accident. All right, next up, we have the last photo of Christopher McCandless. On September 6th, 1992, the decomposing body of Christopher McCandless was found in a bus he had been living in just outside of Denali National Park in Alaska. McCandless had embarked on a journey to leave civilization behind and live off the grid. He spent 113 days living off the land, using the bus as his shelter. His journal entries were discovered, and it was likely he died about 19 days before his body was discovered. After living in the bus for over three months, McCandless finally decided he was going to try and make his way back to civilization. But this was unfortunately not going to be as easy as he thought. The river he had crossed to reach the bus was now much higher and swifter than it was when he first ventured in. He decided to turn back, left an SOS note on the bus reading, attention possible visitors, SOS, I need your help. I'm injured, near death, and too weak to hike out. I'm all alone. This is no joke. In the name of God, please remain to save me. I'm collecting berries close by and shall return this evening. Thank you, Chris McCandless. McCandless succumbed to starvation while waiting for help that never arrived. When his body was discovered, he appeared extremely gaunt, reportedly weighing only around 60 pounds at the time of his death. And finally, we have Princess Diana. This photo was taken by paparazzi in August of 1997 in Paris. Pictured here is Princess Diana, Dottie Fade, and her driver Henry Paul, and bodyguard Trevor Reese Jones, right before a fatal car accident. Reese Jones was the only survivor. Princess Diana and Dottie Fade were in a romantic relationship. They had been vacationing together in the French Riviera when they were pursued by paparazzi. As they left the Ritz Hotel in Paris, their car was chased by paparazzi photographers on motorcycles trying to capture images of the couple. In the Pont d'Alma tunnel, the car lost control and slammed into a concrete pillar. The impact of the crash was severe, leading to the deaths of Princess Diana and the other two in the car. Of course, the bodyguard did survive though. The aggressive pursuit by the paparazzi was widely criticized. Some people blamed them for indirectly causing the accident due to their relentless chase, something that I definitely agree with. I hate paparazzi. Like, just come on, get a real job on it. Starting off this countdown, we have experimental electrical stimulation. Taken in 1856, this photo shows a man undergoing an experiment with electrical stimulation. And by the looks of it, it was quite painful. So back then, they would use the stimulation for a number of reasons. One, to manipulate an experiment on one's nervous system, and two, to treat certain diseases and disorders. Nowadays, this treatment is much safer. They use it to help with injured muscles or manipulate nerves to reduce pain. But back then, they were still trying to get it right. So it makes you wonder how many people underwent these painful experiments. And how many people were accidentally killed before they found the correct voltage to use. In our ninth spot today, we have the lipstick killer. And if you're liking this video so far, then smash that like button because it really helps us out. William George Herons was an American criminal and potential serial killer that confessed to be the lipstick killer. The lipstick killer was someone who took the lives of a number of women and would often leave a creepy message at the scene of the crime in lipstick. That's how he got the name, Lipstick Killer. The photo I'm about to share with you was a creepy message that he left at the scene of one of his crimes in 1945. He wrote, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Now this message is creepy for a number of reasons. First, you got a man on the loose who can't control his impulses and he just admitted it. And second, look how creepy it just looks with the lipstick smeared everywhere and such. It took the police six more months from the time this message was written to finally catch William. This photo is just a scary and dark reminder of the horrors this man committed. Moving on to number 8, we have the poverty. This photo from 1948 shows just how bad poverty was in the 1940s to 50s in America. This is when the poverty rate was at its highest. In this photo, Mr. and Miss Ray Shalifo were facing eviction from their Chicago apartment. They were so desperate for money that they had to sell their kids. Now this photo was a staged photo, but it still shows a heartbroken mother not knowing what else to do. Within two years, all four kids were sold into different homes. It also sheds the light on how different
different laws were back then. Nowadays, that is very much illegal to do. Anyways, this is a very heartbreaking photo. Like, I can't imagine what that family went through. Moving on to number seven, we have the nuclear shadow. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb was so powerful that people up to a mile of it were vaporized. All that was left of them was their shadows burnt into stone. This is a creepy image that shows one of the bomb's victims. It's a silhouette of an elderly man or woman with a cane. So the bomb's light and heat were so powerful that it bleached any exposed surfaces. In this case, the person's body shielded that part on the sidewalk, and that's why an imprint was left there. All around Hiroshima, there were multiple of these body outlines. It's very disturbing and sad. It just shows their final moments alive. In our sixth spot, we have the Dyatlov Pass incident. In February of 1959, a group of nine experienced hikers set out to traverse the snowy mountains of Siberia. However, they all ended up mysteriously dying one by one. This photo was one of the last photos taken of them. Now, this case has been debated about for years, and there's tons of theories as to what happened to them. Some say they were hit by an avalanche at night and died from exposure. Others say a Yeti got them. In fact, there was a picture of a creature that looks like a Yeti found on one of the explorer's cameras. But it's a very odd case. Like, their tent was found ripped open from the inside, two bodies were found and they were only wearing underwear in the freezing cold. Another explorer's body was missing her tongue, eyes, and lips. And two of the other bodies had major chest fractures. To cause someone that much damage, it would be like equivalent to a car crash. And another hiker had a really high level of radiation on their clothes. It's just crazy. And to this day, we don't know what truly happened. We all have these theories, but the only ones that really know are the hikers in the photo. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the submarine murder. Back in August of 2013, freelance journalist Kim Wall got an interview with Danish inventor Peter Madsen. As part of the interview, Kim was set to take a trip on his homemade submarine. This photo shows Kim aboard the submarine just before her trip. Sadly, once inside, Peter killed her and dismembered her body. Why did he do this? Well, some say he became fascinated with murder and torture. Evidence showed that he had been watching videos of women being killed on his computer. And shortly before he beheaded Kim, he watched a video on it. So it was clear that he had a fascination with it. It's sad that Kim had to be his victim. In our fourth spot, we have the Facebook murder. A couple of hours after this picture was taken, Cheyenne Anton left, used the black belt she is seen wearing in that photo to strangle Brittany Gargle. The two were best friends, but apparently got into a heated argument and Cheyenne hit and strangled Brittany. Imagine taking a selfie with someone you thought you could trust just for them to go and kill you a couple hours hours later. It is so sick. Now, Cheyenne actually got away with this murder for two years until police finally found this photo on her Facebook and noticed that the belt that she was wearing was the same one found at the crime scene. She then pleaded guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to seven years in prison. Moving on to number three, we have Parkour Gone Wrong. Pavel Kashin was known for his dangerous stunts and abilities. In 2013, he challenged himself to do a backflip on the edge of a 16 floor building. He successfully completed the backflip, but as he landed, he lost his footing and fell over the edge. He died instantly. This photo was captured by his friend while he was performing the stunt. You can see he's in midair doing his trick. Sadly, that was the last stunt he ever performed. And at number two, we have the stalker. On February of 2017, best friends Abby Williams and Libby German headed out for a hike in Indiana. This photo is of Abby Williams, taken right before they were both murdered. What's very disturbing is that in the background of these photos, you can literally see their killer lurking there. Apparently the man was stalking them for quite some time and in the girl's photo roll, they actually got some pictures of him, probably because they felt like he was following them. So in the last photo ever taken of Abby, you can literally see her killer behind her. It makes me so sick. Worst of all, he's never been caught. There's currently a reward for anyone that can identify the man though, so hopefully they can get some justice soon. And in our number one spot, we have the gruesome scene. This this photo is going to send shivers down your spine. But before I show you, let me give you a quick backstory. So this photo was taken of Travis Alexander while he was taking a shower. It was taken by his girlfriend and murderer, Jody, shortly before she stabbed him 27 to 29 times. She also slit his throat nearly ear to ear and shot him in the head. It was a very gruesome and sinister murder. In this photo, you can see how uncomfortable Travis
Travis looks. It's almost as if he knew she was up to something. He looks absolutely terrified. Now the camera that captured this photo was actually tossed into his washing machine as an attempt to destroy it. But it didn't work and some of the photos were still salvageable. Like this one and one that she took of Travis's dead bloody body. I saw it. You don't want to see. Starting off this countdown, we have 1930s Halloween. Who here likes Halloween? Smash that like button if you do. And also let me know what your favorite costume is that you've ever worn. Back in the 1930s, Halloween looked a lot different. Obviously, they didn't have a party city or spirit Halloween where they could just go to and buy a costume from. No, no, costumes were often homemade, which makes them look terrifying. Look at this photo. These individuals are in Halloween costumes. I'm sorry, but who are they dressed up as? The women look terrifying with those weird masks on. I would freak out if I saw someone walking down the street dressed like that on Halloween. Like those are some next level purge masks. They seriously give me the creeps. In our ninth spot, we have the exorcism of Annalise. Annalise was a devout Catholic woman who is said to have been possessed by five different demons. It all started one day when she blacked out at school and began walking around all dazed. She didn't remember anything. People around her said that she was in a trance-like state. Soon these blackouts became more frequently. Things started to get worse and she started to convulse and hallucinate randomly. Eventually she claimed that she saw the face of the devil and could hear demons whispering in her ears. In the end, she underwent 67 exorcisms, some lasting up to four hours. This photo of Annalise shows you in her possessed state. It's very creepy and her story is honestly so disturbing and scary and sad. Moving on at number 8 we have the mutated piglet. In 1986 in Ukraine an accident at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant caused the reactor to explode. This explosion had lasting effects and to this day it's still considered the worst nuclear disaster. A lot of people and animals were affected by this. In fact the animals that lived there in the late 1980s suffered tremendously from the nuclear waste. This is a picture of a mutated piglet. It was born with a deformity, believed to have been caused by its mother being exposed to the radiation. This pig is now on display at the Ukrainian National Chernobyl Museum, you know, in case you wanted to go and see it up close. In our seventh spot we have The Wake. This photo was taken in around the 1920s during a wake for the man featured in the photo. Well, directly to the left of the photo by the two mourning individuals appears to be a ghostly apparition. Is this the deceased man still lingering over his body? Or is it another ghostly entity? Well, we don't know for sure. But what we do know is that this photo is very, very creepy. I mean, you can see the ghost as clear as day. Hopefully, it's just the man saying one last goodbye before going to the afterlife and not a demon. In our sixth spot today, we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. The Stanford Prison Experiment set out to explore the psychological effects of imprisonment. It started on August 14th, 1971. A university psychology professor gathered a bunch of student volunteers and divided them into groups. 11 were assigned the role of guards and 10 were assigned the role of prisoners. It's going to be a two week experiment where the volunteers would play their part in a make believe prison. But the experiment had to be ended after only six days. The volunteers got way into character. Some guards turned sadistic. They really exercised their power over the prisoners. Whereas many prisoners became depressed and showed signs of extreme stress. The study and this creepy photo provide a chilling look at what human are capable of. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the wild man suit. Not only is this a dark photo from history, but it's also a very mysterious one. This suit that you're seeing is what historians named the wild man suit. It consists of a double layered set of armor covered in one inch long iron nails. What was it used for you may ask? Well, no one knows for sure. One popular theory is that it was used during bear hunting in the 1800s. Or it was used in bear baiting. Don't know if that's true but it looks very uncomfortable to wear. Maybe it was a twisted torture device. The executioner would wear it and then give the prisoner a nice big and tight hug. I don't know, I'm just guessing, but either way it's messed up. In our fourth spot today we have the ruins of Hiroshima. Here is another very scary and sad photo taken after America dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb had an explosive yield equal to 15,000 tons of TNT. In fact, it destroyed five square miles of the city. This photo shows the ruins of the once beautiful city. Build 
buildings and wildlife were completely destroyed by this bomb. In fact, the US remains to be the only country to ever use an atomic bomb in war. It had a huge lasting impact on the city that we should never forget about. In our third spot today, we have the Titanic. On April 15th, 1912, the infamous ship, the Titanic, began to sink. 1,500 passengers sank with the ship after a hit an iceberg during its maiden voyage. The few that did manage to survive fled on lifeboats. This is a picture of the last lifeboat approaching the rescue ship. You can see it was crammed with passengers as all the lifeboats were. This photo serves as a reminder of this great tragedy in history and all the innocent individuals that were impacted by this disaster. In our second spot today, we have the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. In 1906, San Francisco was hit with a massive 7.9 magnitude earthquake. It has since garnered the title of the most powerful earthquake in Northern Californian history. This earthquake not only caused homes to come crumbling down, but it also started a number of fires throughout the city. Hundreds of fires started as a result of the broken gas lines. These fires went on for three days, engulfing 500 city blocks. More than 3,000 people passed away from the earthquake and fires. 20,000 buildings were destroyed and 200,000 citizens were left homeless. It was very sad and tragic. This is a photo from this devastating time. This was after all the damage was done. People lined the streets and just stared at the destruction that the earthquake caused. And in our number one spot today, we have the American Buffalo. Now this photo is absolutely heartbreaking. This was taken in 1892 Michigan, and that is an actual mountain made up of buffalo skulls. That means thousands of buffaloes were slaughtered. No wonder why the buffalo population is considered near threatened and are at risk for extinction. So these skulls were then ground down to be used in making bone china or refining sugar and producing fertilizer. It's said that around the end of the 18th century, there were between 30 to 60 million buffaloes on the continent. When this photo was taken, the population was at only 456. They literally slaughtered millions of buffalo. What makes it worse is that some of the buffalo were killed purposely just so that the indigenous individuals were deprived of them. Starting off at number 10, vampire killings. So starting us off, we have the supposed vampire killings from the 1800s. Now, spoiler alert here, they weren't actually vampires. Well, I guess I don't know that for sure, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say they weren't. Anyways, back in the 1800s, people in New England believed that cadavers were rising from their graves at night and preying on the living. So to solve this problem, they began exhuming the cadavers. Now, some kept it simple and just turned the cadaver face down, but others jumped to more extreme methods, like ripping the bones apart and rearranging them, or burning the deceased person's heart and inhaling the smoke. Apparently at the time, it was believed inhaling the smoke cured tuberculosis, though I can only imagine it made matters much worse for them. Some towns were so into the ritual that they would even hold festivals during the process and celebrate the exhumation and subsequent destruction of the corpses altogether. So while it was incredibly unsettling, they did truly believe they were vampires haunting them in the night, so I guess it gave them some peace of mind. Next up at number nine, dentures. While today dentures are made from composite resin or sometimes porcelain, during the 18th and 19th centuries, of course, those materials weren't available. But as you can imagine, people were still losing teeth at an even higher rate due to the high sugar diet, attempted teeth whitening, which was really just wearing away their enamel instead of brightening it, and the overall lack of knowledge around hygiene. So dentures were still needed and wanted by many. So what was their material of choice? Well, for the easiest and most profitable route, many would acquire the teeth from dead bodies. Although if you had some money, you might be able to afford dentures made from ivory. Other materials were sometimes the teeth of animals or wood, but honestly, I think we can all agree that none of those sound like terribly sanitary options, considering professional physicians at the time weren't sterilizing instruments and some didn't even believe in disinfecting prior to surgery. Next up at number eight, stained glass. If you walk into just about any old church, you'll notice the walls are decorated with beautiful stained glass. But what might surprise you is that in some of the particularly older pieces, there is a strange ingredient that helps it all come together. In 1112, a German monk wrote about the process 
process of creating the beautifully colored glass. And as he detailed, it starts off innocently enough, adding sand and potash at a high temp until it becomes molten. From there, they'd add a stabilizer before coloring the glass with different metallic oxides like copper, cobalt, and gold. But once the glass was cooled and shaped, the small details were added by paint. They made the paint usually from lead or copper and would then suspend it in urine. So quite literally some of those old stained glass windows were painted with pea paint. Which I mean kind of just makes me giggle if I'm honest, but it is definitely a weird ingredient to think about being in paint. Coming in at number 7, leather bound books. Nowadays it's unusual to even find real leather on anything, but once upon a time the leather on books wasn't even from cows, it was from people. Called anthropodermic bibliopegy, the books were made in a similar way as they would now, but obviously with one huge difference. They used human skin instead of an animal. While there are actually only 18 confirmed books of its kind that still exist, we have no idea just how many there could have been all those years ago. Allegedly the books were usually made from executed convicts, and during the French Revolution there were rumors that a tannery for human human skin was established outside of Paris. I mean it kind of gives me the willies to think about it and I'm just glad we've moved on to a different material to bind our books today. Coming in at number 6 we have the Mickey Mouse gas masks. Did you know that Walt Disney once designed a very creepy gas mask for children? Yeah. So the use of chemical war during World War II made it so everyone would carry around a gas mask with them, just in case. So in 1942, Mr. Disney himself invented a Mickey Mouse inspired gas mask. It was meant to calm terrified kids. Yes, I will repeat, this was meant to calm terrified kids. And clearly scare parents because that seriously is nightmare fuel. Imagine seeing people walking around wearing those. No thank you. That's anything but comforting. Mickey looks like a demon. Anyways, with the help of the Sun Rubber Company, about 1,000 of these masks were made. They thought kids would be more inclined to wear them if they were in the shape of a fun loving mouse. But in the end, they just turned out to be fairly creepy, like if you agree. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the expressionless. So this creepy looking mannequin thing is a dummy that nurses would use in training back in 1968. Okay, if I was a nurse and had to pretend that that was my patient, bro I'd quit. She looks terrifying. Anyways, that's all I could find about this dummy, like I'm not sure if they would practice CPR on her or what. But you may recognize this photo because it inspired the creepypasta called The Expressionless. So the creepypasta is fake, but the photo and the dummy is very much real. I swear, did they purposely make the dummy terrifying to scare the nurses or what? In our fourth spot we have Gas Mask Island. About 110 miles south of Tokyo, Japan, there's a small island called Miyakijima otherwise known as Gas Mask Island. How did it get its name? Well, this island is home to Mount Oyama, a very active volcano that emits poisonous sulfuric gas. So all of the residents have to carry gas masks with them at all time. You know, just in case these gas levels rise unexpectedly. This photo shows the residents of the island wearing their gas masks. And I know what you're thinking. This photo looks like it came straight out of an end of the world horror movie. I agree, it's insane. You thought wearing medical masks was bad? Imagine wearing a gas mask around town. Would not be fun. Number 3. The Diet Love Pass Incident the Diet Love Pass incident was an event in which nine Soviet hikers died in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd, 1959, under uncertain circumstances. This creepy photo shows the determined group traversing the harsh terrain just before they met their fate on the night of February 1st. The experienced trekking group from the Ural Polytechnical Institute, led by Igor Dyatlov, had established a camp in the Russian SFSR of the Soviet Union. Now, overnight, something caused them to cut their way 
way out of their tent and flee the campsite while inadequately dressed for the heavy snowfall and sub zero temperatures. Now, after the group's bodies were discovered, an investigation by Soviet authorities determined that six of them had died from hypothermia, while the other three had died by physical trauma. One victim had major skull damage, two had severe chest trauma, and another had a small crack in his skull. Four of the bodies were found lying in running water in a creek, and three of those four had damaged soft tissue of the head and face. Two of the bodies had missing eyes, one had a missing tongue, and one had missing eyebrows. Number two, treatment of a patient with mental illness. This 1890 photo depicts a woman forced into a crucifixion pose and facing a wall. The woman is a patient at a mental institution undergoing treatment. Now, believe it or not, forced standing was considered a legitimate part of treatment for mental illness in 19th century Germany. Now, back in the 18th and early 20th century, women were sometimes institutionalized due to their opinions and their inability to be controlled properly by a primarily male dominated culture. There were financial incentives too, because before the passage of the Married Women's Property Act 1882, all of a wife's assets passed automatically to her husband. The men who were in charge of these women, either a husband, father, or brother, could send these women to mental institutions, stating they believed that these women were mentally ill because of their strong opinions. These men had the last say when it came to the mental health of these women, so if they believed that these women were mentally ill, or if they simply wanted to silence the voices and opinions of these women, they could easily send them to mental institutions. This is what could have happened to this woman in that photograph. Now, besides standing, practices at these asylums were dark as they had treatments that included restraints, isolation, electroshock therapy, ice baths, forced drugging, and even lobotomies. And coming in at number one is mustard gas tested on American military. Mustard gas is a type of chemical warfare agent, and as a chemical weapon, mustard gas was first used in World War I. In 1943, the US Navy exposed its own sailors to mustard gas. Now, officially, the Navy was testing the effectiveness of new clothing and gas masks against the deadly gas that had proven so terrifying in the First World War. Young men were approached after eight weeks of boot camp and asked if they wanted to participate in an experiment that would help shorten the war. Obviously, they said yes, but they didn't know what they were signing up for. Only when the boys reached the research laboratory were they told the experiment involved mustard gas. Now, the participants, almost all of whom suffered several external and internal burns, were ignored by the Navy and in some cases were threatened with the Espionage Act. In 1991, the reports were finally declassified and taken before Congress. So the first photo we're taking a look at is this one one here. On February 3rd of 1959, musicians J.P. Richardson, also known as the Big Bopper, Richie Valens, and Buddy Holly tragically died in a plane crash near Clear Lake, Iowa, in what is famously known as the day the music died. This is the last photo taken of the three before boarding their final flight. The musicians have been traveling on a small uh, Beechcraft Bonanza airplane, chartered after their tour bus broke down. The plane, piloted by Rob Roger Peterson took off from the Mason City Municipal Airport en route to Hector Airport in Fargo, North Dakota. The weather conditions on the night of the crash were poor, with a combination of snow, sleet, and fog. And despite these conditions, the flight took off anyway. And the plane crashed only a few minutes after takeoff, around 1 a.m., into a cornfield near Clear Lake. There were no survivors. If you like videos just like this, creepy paranormal stuff, cryptid stuff, ghost stuff, we got at all, so hit that subscribe button and don't miss out. Next on the list is the 1943 Glider crash. This is the last photograph taken of William D. Becker, the former mayor of St. Louis, along with several other prominent men in the community, right after boarding a brand new Waco CG4 Glider, manufactured by William B. Robertson, also pictured here. This was going to be the first public demonstration of the aircraft taking flight. Spectators watched from Lampert St. Louis Airport as the men boarded the glider. What they didn't know was that they were witnessing the last moments of these men's lives. The glider was taxied by a plane to a runaway for takeoff. They took flight and once ready to allow the glider to 
glide, the towing cable was released. Almost immediately after the glider was released though, something terrifying happened. Its right wing completely snapped off. Now a wing snapping off of an aircraft spells disaster no matter what type of aircraft it is. But uh, keep in mind these gliders were engineless, created specifically for the war efforts to be released like this and then glide down usually into enemy lines. So now completely on its own and missing a wing, there was no way for it to make a safe landing. It just plummeted towards the earth, crashing into the ground. All 10 men aboard died on impact. Next up, we have the death of Robert Overacker. Robert Overacker was a daredevil from Camarillo, California. At 12.35 p.m. October 1st, he attempted to go over Niagara Falls on a jet ski with the intention of raising awareness about the homeless. And during his attempt, Overacker wore a life jacket and was carrying a flag promoting a charity for the homeless. He had also intended to deploy a parachute at the last moment to escape the fall. But the parachute didn't deploy and he plunged over the falls. This photo was taken just as he went over. He was only 39 years old. Moving on to number seven, we have the nuclear shadow. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb was so powerful that people up to a mile of it were vaporized. All that was left of them was their shadows burnt into stone. This is a creepy image that shows one of the bomb's victims. It's a silhouette of an elderly man or woman with a cane. So the bomb's light and heat were so powerful that it bleached any exposed surfaces. In this case, the person's body shielded that part on the sidewalk, and that's why an imprint was left there. All around Hiroshima, there were multiple of these body outlines. It's very disturbing and sad. It just shows their final moments alive. In our sixth spot today, we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. The Stanford Prison Experiment set out to explore the psychological effects of imprisonment. It started on August 14th, 1971. A university psychology professor gathered a bunch of student volunteers and divided them into groups. 11 were assigned the role of guards and 10 were assigned the role of prisoners. It's going to be a two week experiment where the volunteers would play their part in a make believe prison. But the experiment had to be ended after only six days. The volunteers got way into character. Some guards turned sadistic. They really exercised their power over the prisoners. Whereas many prisoners became depressed and showed signs of extreme stress. The study and this creepy photo provide a chilling look at what humans are capable of. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the wild man suit. Not only is this a dark photo from history, but it's also a very mysterious one. This suit that you're seeing is what historians named the wild man suit. It consists of a double layered set of armor covered in one inch long iron nails. What was it used for you may ask? Well, no one knows for sure. One popular theory is that it was used during bear hunting in the 1800s. Or it was used in bear baiting. Don't know if that's true, but it looks very uncomfortable to wear. Maybe it was a twisted torture device. The executioner would wear it and then give the prisoner a nice big and tight hug. I don't know, I'm just guessing, but either way it's messed up. In our fourth spot today, we have the ruins of Hiroshima. Here is another very scary and sad photo taken after America dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb had an explosive yield equal to 15,000 tons of TNT. In fact, it destroyed five square miles of the city. This photo shows the ruins of the once beautiful city. Buildings and wildlife were completely destroyed destroyed by this bomb. In fact, the US remains to be the only country to ever use an atomic bomb in war. It had a huge lasting impact on the city that we should never forget about. In our third spot today, we have the Titanic. On April 15th, 1912, the infamous ship the Titanic began to sink. 1,500 passengers sank with the ship after a hit an iceberg during its maiden voyage. The few that did manage to survive fled on lifeboats. This is a picture of the last lifeboat approaching the rescue ship. You can see it was crammed with passengers as all the lifeboats were. This photo serves as a reminder of this great tragedy in history and all the innocent individuals that were impacted by this disaster. In our second spot today, we have the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. In 1906, San Francisco was hit with a massive 7.9 magnitude earthquake. It has since garnered the title of the most powerful earthquake in Northern Californian history. This earthquake not only caused homes to come crumbling down, but it also started a number of fires throughout the city. Hundreds of fires started as a result of the broken gas gas lines. These fires went on for three days, engulfing 500 city blocks. More than 3,000 people passed away from the earthquake and fires. 20,000 buildings were destroyed and 200,000 citizens were left homeless. It was very sad and tragic. This is a photo from this devastating time. This was after all the damage
damage was done. People lined the streets and just stared at the destruction that the earthquake caused. And in our number one spot today, we have the American Buffalo. Now this photo is absolutely heartbreaking. This was taken in 1892 Michigan, and that is an actual mountain made up of buffalo skulls. That means thousands of buffaloes were slaughtered. No wonder why the buffalo population is considered near threatened and are at risk for extinction. So these skulls were then ground down to be used in making bone china or refining sugar and producing fertilizer. It's said that around the end of the 18th century, there were between 30 to 60 million buffaloes on the continent. When this photo was taken, the population was at only 456. They literally slaughtered millions of buffalo. What makes it worse is that some of the buffalo were killed purposely just so that the indigenous individuals were deprived of them. Starting off this countdown, we have experimental electrical stimulation. Taken in 1856, this photo shows a man undergoing an experiment with electrical stimulation. And by the looks of it, it was quite painful. So back then, they would use the stimulation for a number of reasons. One, to manipulate an experiment on one's nervous system, and two, to treat certain diseases and disorders. Nowadays, this treatment is much safer. They use it to help with injured muscles or manipulate nerves to reduce pain. But back then, they were still trying to get it right. So it makes you wonder how many people underwent these painful experiments, and how many people were accidentally killed before they found the correct voltage to use. In our ninth spot today, we have the lipstick killer. And if you're liking this video so far, then smash that like button because it really helps us out. William George Herons was an American criminal and potential serial killer that confessed to be the lipstick killer. The lipstick killer was someone who took the lives of a number of women and would often leave a creepy message at the scene of the crime in lipstick. That's how he got the name, Lipstick Killer. The photo I'm about to share with you was a creepy message that he left at the scene of one of his crimes in 1945. He wrote, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Now this message is creepy for a number of reasons. First, you got a man on the loose who can't control his impulses and he just admitted it. And second, look how creepy it just looks with the lipstick smeared everywhere and such. It took the police six more months from the time this message was written to finally catch William. This photo is just a scary and dark reminder of the horrors this man committed. Moving on to number eight, we have the poverty. This photo from 1948 shows just how bad poverty was in the 1940s to 50s in America. This is when the poverty rate was at its highest. In this photo, Mr. and Miss Ray Shalafo were facing eviction from their Chicago apartment. They were so desperate for money that they had to sell their kids. Now this photo was a stage photo, but it still shows a heartbroken mother not knowing what else to do. Within two years, all four kids were sold into different homes. It also sheds the light on how different laws were back then. Nowadays, that is very much illegal to do. Anyways, this is a very heartbreaking photo. Like, I can't imagine what that family went through. Number seven, adhesive bras. We'll liven this up a little bit with some vintage history that's it's kind of funny. It's pretty funny. Let's talk about sticky bras, shall we? What a mess this was, oh my. Back in 1949, Life Magazine released an article that caught everybody's attention, obviously. This was news, this was like a new technology that was being announced. It was May 16th, 1949, and the article read, for 5,000 years, clothes have been draped, tied, buttoned, pinned, and buckled on the human form. This year, for the first time in history, drum roll, they will be glued on. What in the world, how? This is witchcraft, how did that happen? Just. One, two, that's it, that's easy. Inventor Charles Langs changed the game, or he thought he did, in 1949. He made these bra cups that would stick to you with adhesive, this, you know, special glue. This special glue. This specific adhesive was promised to leave behind no residue, it was supposed to be painless, yet at the same time, stay glued on even if you were to jump into a pool from a 10 foot diving board. That was the sell. Yeah, well, that's not true. That's definitely not true. Well, Langs ended up selling the company to Textron later on, and the product ultimately failed. Number six, nuclear sight list. All right, back to the, you know, back to the dark stuff. Here on Most Amazing, we love lists, right? I'm not sure if you can tell. Smash that thumbs up, hit subscribe, yada yada, we love it. But apparently the US government also fancies a list or two. Who thought? Back when Obama was still running the show, a report was delivered to Congress, or rather it was supposed to be. The 266 page report featuring, you know, every nook and cranny about the US nuclear program. It was released publicly on the government printing office's website in draft form. 
draft form. Couldn't have been easier. Just a casual PDF that shows us maps with stockpiled fuel used for nuclear warheads. Awesome. Right next to your resume. Imagine that. So convenient. How does this even happen? I thought this type of stuff could never happen, right? Well, MIT professor John M. Dutch said that these screw ups do, of course, happen and it's normal. And this one here isn't a serious breach. I mean, it certainly sounds serious, but okay. We'll just have to trust the government. Number five, UFOs in the ocean. This video here was leaked in the last couple of years. You've probably seen it, hopefully not. This would be a great day. The footage itself was recorded in 2019 in San Diego. Now the Pentagon has since of course confirmed its authenticity and the UAP, the unidentified aerial phenomenon here, is sphere shaped and it's flying at extremely high speeds. There's no exhaust, no propulsion system whatsoever. It's just a metal ball whipping by San Diego and now, we're questioning our beliefs, so that's fun. The sphere vanished into the water afterwards, into the ocean, and then was never seen ever again. Number four, radar footage. Now normally when we see leaked footage, be it of UAPs or leaked documents, whatever, it's always the worst quality. Like that one, not the best, right? Not quite 4K. It's hard to believe when military footage is poor quality, right? Like how can we see photos of black holes and not even have a photo of a UAP yet, right? What's going on here? Well, Jeremy Corbell, he's here to help. Jeremy? What if he just walked in? That would be crazy. He's not here. That's insane. Jeremy took to Twitter in May 2021 sharing footage of US Navy ships being swarmed by UFOs. Like more than one. Sorry, UAPs. We're not going to call them that anymore. Now this time we have radar footage and that's pretty sweet. That's different. It came from the Combat Information Center aboard the USS Omaha. The 46 second clip was originally recorded July 15th, 2019. You can even hear people in the background reacting to what's happening in real time. You hear panic in their voices. These military personnel in the background, you can overhear them talking about how fast the objects are moving on the radar. So seems very believable this time, right? It's not just a grainy footage. It's like a live reaction kind of. And if he's spooked, we're spooked, right? Number three, Watergate. I have to include Watergate, right? It's one of the biggest scandals in US history. Right in the middle of 1972, there were five men who were all arrested for breaking into the Democratic National Committee headquarters at the Watergate Hotel in Washington, DC. It was clear that they intended on bugging the place, right? It was fishy, it was obvious, they looked like and spy kids, right? They were up to no good. Now, as the year went on, the election came closer and closer, and all of a sudden, out of the woodwork comes this anonymous source who fed information to Washington Post that the Watergate bugging incident was a massive campaign of political spying and sabotage kicked off by none other than President Nixon himself. It was kicked off by his re-election and directed by officials of the White House. It was a whole planned thing. Now, despite this information leak and it being reported to the news, Nixon was still re-elected. Now these men were clearly linked to a fundraising group for Nixon, but his administration just kept denying any involvement, right? That's the key. Deny, deny, deny. It wasn't until later that year in 1972 when reporters Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, they came forward and exposed everything. Now we got the truth. They exposed the administrator's role in the entire scandal, how they had an inside source, an FBI agent named Mark Felt. It was a whole thing. This ultimately led to Nixon resigning in 1974, the first ever president to do so. Yeah, that's how you know you got caught when you have to resign. Know what I mean? Number two, shadow brokers. Back in August 2016, a group named the Shadow Brokers were the talk of the town. And with that name, how can you not be, right? The Shadow Brokers would steal cyber weapons from an NSA hacking unit and then proceed to sell them online to the highest bidder. Now this sounds made up. This sounds like it's from a movie. This is crazy, right? Now these tools, these tools in question, these cyber weapons, they've been used by many countries and many not so great sounding schemes. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, you name it, these cyber attacks can happen anywhere, right? The 2019 ransomware cyber attack, that's one example. This incident was connected to the Shadow Brokers. So whoever this mysterious group is, it still remains a mystery and still sounds made up as sh it sounds like a DC Comics villain. It's insane. And finally, number one, motorized roller skates. We'll end on a fun one because, you know, why not? This last one they've been working on for a very long time and we still can't crack it, right? This is the craziest thing I've ever seen working on this channel, so I gotta end with it. Motorized roller skates. What a nightmare this would be. Imagine if this worked out. Even Elon Musk would see this and be like, no, that's crazy. 
This photo was taken at the Seneca Station in Hartford, Connecticut. Now context aside, this is an odd one. A guy with a briefcase is filling up at the gas station and he's wearing roller skates. That would look bad today. You would have SWAT teams rolling up if you saw that, right? It's 1956 and that futuristic looking man right there is Mike Dreschler. Now at the time he was working for a Detroit skate company, but he was very close to gas powered skates. They would have cost around $250, which today is around $2,400. And it's max speed was 17 miles an hour. Again, imagine that in the closing act of like a Mission Impossible movie. That's crazy. Now obviously the public wasn't supposed to see this. They feared that it would encourage folks to get creative on their own and you know, launch their way to work. So yeah, don't make rocket skates with gasoline. Thanks. Kicking off our list at number 10, the reindeer gift. We'll turn the clocks back to 1941, right off the hop. When the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union, it was of course one of the biggest attacks in history. Britain and the United States had to send over weapons, supplies, anything really, just to keep them afloat, just to keep them in the fight. Now they sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle, that was the only route, but of course it was littered with U-boats, you know, war stuff. So thankfully the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters, and in turn the Soviets were able to fight on. As a gift, as a thank you rather, the Soviets sent the captain of the Trident, they sent him a live reindeer. That the British of course had to accept because it was ill-mannered if you don't. So they had to keep a six foot tall, real life living reindeer on a submarine. Must be comfortable, awesome. Imagine the smell. Her name was Pollyanna and they brought her on board through a torpedo tube. She was tiny, she's the cutest little thing. She was a crew member for six weeks, which is honestly hilarious because you know some of those guys got way too attached, you know for sure. She slept better than most if I'm being honest, she shared her room in the captain's quarters. Again, imagine the smell. I don't know, is it worth it? I've always wanted a baby goat growing up, so this is kind of the closest thing. I'm jealous, I'm weirdly jealous. Number nine, Stalin Photoshop. Deep fakes are getting out of hand. I have no idea what's real or what's fake anymore. To be honest, I'm not even Taylor. I'm actually Olivia doing a list right now, but it's been deep faked so well that you believe it. Modern technology is really making it hard to tell what's real and what's not, but it goes back. Back in 1939, a photo of Stalin was published and he he looks normal. He actually looks kind of great. Some would say he looks way too good. You know what I mean? He was touching up photos as far back as 1939, just airbrushing, just digitally removing all those zits and stuff. Like really? That far back? But even if you got a photo with Stalin, there's a chance that you yourself would be digitally removed. Like Nikolai Yitzhak, for example, the leader of the NKVD. He was in a photo with Stalin, but around 1937, Nikolai was responsible for orders that had over 1 million people arrested. So it wasn't ideal to be in a photo with Nikolai at the time. So he was denounced, imprisoned, and he died in 1940. So Stalin had him digitally erased and replaced in a photo. That's pretty hilarious. I don't know, this man was ahead of his time via Photoshop. How did he do it? How did they do it? No one knows. Number eight, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Nice, I remember this one. I heard about this on LimeWire. That was cool. Heard about that at full volume. This was a huge presidential scandal. Back when you, you know, didn't happen every other week and stuff, this was a big deal. It was 1998 and Clinton's White House intern Monica Lewinsky was 22 years old at the time. Yeah, young. When you think back to all this old history, you're like, oh, they were this. No, very young, extremely young. They had a from 1995 to 1997, despite what LimeWire told us. Lewinsky said she hooked up with Bill nine different times at the White House, and apparently, according to her schedule, Hillary Clinton was at the White House for at least seven of those times. She's like, what's going on in there, huh? Is that my... Who is that? At number seven, Ronaldo Dagsa. He was a Filipino politician, a member of the peacekeeping action team, and a corporal in the Philippine Army Reserve Command. Now this photo is not of Dagsa before he passed, but due to how haunting it is, I still had to include it. His passing achieved notoriety due to the picture he snapped of his family on New Year's with unbelievable timing. The image Dagsa captured also inadvertently captured the man who was about to take the shot that would ultimately take his life. The photo was extremely helpful when it came to investigating investigators identifying the shooter because the image shows the gunman quite literally seconds before taking the fatal shot. The picture was taken outside the councilman's house in metropolitan Manila. The photo led to a quick arrest of the shooter as well as his accomplice. Apparently the suspects were known car thieves out on bail, likely holding a grudge against Dexa who had the men arrested a year earlier. It is extremely sad that Dexa unknowingly captured his own final moments, especially with his family being right there, but at least they were able to use it to catch the gunman. Number six. 
Randwick's discount flight. Keith Sapsard was from Randwick, New South Wales. He passed away just 14 years old with his final moments caught on camera. On February 22, 1970, the teen snuck onto the tarmac at Sydney Airport in Australia with the idea to hide inside a Tokyo bound plane in order to run away. Unfortunately, Sapsford would never make it to Tokyo. His father described Keith as a curious kid who always had an urge to keep on the move. Due to his restlessness, his parents decided to send him to Boys Town, a Roman Catholic institution specializing in troubled children, for some discipline and structure. Instead, Sapsford escaped from the facility after a couple weeks and headed to the airport. Thanks to the far more relaxed regulations and security of the 70s, Sapsford was able to sneak onto the tarmac with ease. It's unknown if Keith knew where the plane was headed, but he saw a plane preparing for boarding and climbed into its wheel well. It took a few hours for the plane to take off, but eventually it made its way to the sky. What Keith didn't know was that the plane was going to reopen the wheel compartments to retract the wheels. When this happened, Sapsford fell out of the plane, falling 200 feet. One of the craziest things about this tragic event was by pure coincidence. Photographer John Gilpin was simply taking pictures at the airport when he unknowingly snapped a pic at the exact same time Sapsford was falling from the plane. I bet when he developed that roll of film, he was totally surprised. His father later said, All my son wanted to do was see the world. He had itchy feet and his determination to see how the rest of the world lives cost him his life. Obviously, what happened to Keith was a tragedy, but the photo captured by Gilpin is remarkable as well as haunting. At number 5, Fatal Friend Brittany Gargle and Cheyenne Antoine were the best of friends until they weren't. Apparently, Brittany was extremely hardworking. At 16, she was juggling school and two jobs. Antoine had a rough upbringing with her parents falling into substance use. Cheyenne grew up in foster care. At 15, Antoine's mother passed away, and to cope with the news, she got involved with some dangerous company, also falling into substance use. That's when the two girls met, and Brittany helped Cheyenne manage her feelings, and the two became close. On March 25, 2015, Brittany posted a picture of her and Cheyenne on social media. The two planned to go out for drinks and have fun, but as the night went on, things got out of hand and the details became fuzzy. The girls traveled to a pub, then to a house party, and then one more pub. Cheyenne claimed that around 4 a.m., Brittany asked a man for a lighter and invited him for drinks, but she didn't know what happened later. Cheyenne heard nothing from Brittany the next day, and later the police received a 911 call of a woman lying on her back, cold to the touch. The woman was identified as Brittany. Cheyenne was questioned and her story checked out, but the police thought she was hiding something. As the police dug further, more details came out. In the end, Brittany's passing was ruled a strangling, and this led to oh my god, and this led them to a crucial lead. It was the picture Cheyenne had posted on social media the night of the events. In it, Cheyenne was wearing a stylish black belt, the same belt that had been found at the crime scene. In 2017, after all the evidence collected, Cheyenne was arrested for taking Brittany's life, with Cheyenne claiming not to remember anything due to the substances. In the end, Cheyenne was sentenced to seven years in prison with her release in 2024. At number four, the final dive. Nicholas Mavoli was an American free diver who passed doing what he loved, but not before taking a picture that will give you the chills. Mavoli began free diving competitively in 2012, winning titles twice at the Deja Blue competition and finishing third at the Caribbean Cup in Honduras. With much success in his newfound passion, Mavoli only wanted to take things even further. On November 15, 2013, he prepared to dive into Dean's Blue Hole, hoping to reach 72 meters on a single inhalation with no fins or supplemental oxygen. Surrounded by 15 other athletes and observers, as well as five safety divers, he submerged face first, looking like a human arrow diving into the darkness that would ultimately end up being his last dive. Mike Board, free diving record holder, said diving into a depth with no fins, that's a hard physical dive. I was thinking, okay, he's going to have a hard time getting up. Yet, after a dive of 3 minutes and 38 seconds, Mavoli shot back up to the surface. Unfortunately, instead of celebrating the dive, things quickly turned into a nightmare. Mavoli ripped off his goggles, flashed the OK sign, and attempted to complete surface protocol that would make the attempt official by saying, I am OK. But he wasn't. His words came out jumbled and his eyes were wide and blank. This moment was captured on camera, and the blank fear in the diver's eyes is frightening. He lost consciousness and never regained it after suffering a pulmonary edema. 
Coming in at number three, James Jameson. One of the heirs to the Jameson whiskey family fortune, Jameson considered himself to be an adventurer of sorts and often traveled to far off lands detailing the trips in his diary. In 1888, Jameson decided to head out to explore the Congo and while there he wrote about and demanded some gruesome things from the locals. So before beginning this expedition, Jameson discovered that the area he was visiting was known to have a population that participated in the eating of other humans. Apparently Jameson set out to witness it firsthand, which I mean, why was that his dream? A little suspicious if you ask me, but I digress. According to Assad Faran, who was his translator for the trip, Jameson bought a girl from a trader of slaves for a few handkerchiefs and gave her over to the tribe to be Allegedly, he didn't pay the tribe directly, but in a roundabout way, he did sort of pay to have this girl c What's even more gross is that he proceeded to draw and paint watercolors of the gruesome event while it happened. Which again, just wrong on so many levels. Coming in at number two, Cambodian Barbies. You may have been taught about the Khmer Rouge in history class, but if they don't ring a bell, essentially they were an extreme communist regime in Cambodia that held government between 1975 to 1979. They were known for being extremely cruel and committed some of the most horrifying acts of genocide in history, with nearly two million perishing under their ruling. Now, during their radical rule, the entire country was isolated from all foreign influences. This included closing schools, hospitals, factories, banks, foreign agriculture. They believed this would stimulate the rebirth of the country, but of course, all it did was send it into desolate famine and poverty. Led by a man named Pol Pot, the people of the country could not forage for food, despite the fact that everyone was starving, and anyone who disobeyed the orders was killed. Apparently, as the people became more and more desperate, they began to turn to folk magic turning Barbie dolls into smoking talismans for luck. Thankfully, since its dissolution in 1999, all the leaders have been jailed for their atrocities and the people are freed from the genocidal regime. And last up in our number one spot, the rabbit woman. Her name was Mary Toft, and in 1726, she became known throughout Surrey, England as having been the woman who gave birth to rabbits. Now, I know what you're thinking, that isn't possible. And you would be right, but but still the story of how she convinced people it was real was crazy. Apparently Toft was actually pregnant at one point, but miscarried and it could have been this that sent her into her madness. Toft began declaring that she was giving birth to various animal parts, and so her local doctor became involved in the case. At first everyone actually believed her, as in fact a rabbit did, well, come out of her. And with a doctor backing up her claims, the king and his royal surgeon got involved. Unlike her local doctor, the king surgeon was skeptical, and after discovering corn inside the stomach of one of the rabbits and hay in their droppings, it proved the animal hadn't developed inside Mary. Eventually Mary Toft admitted to the hoax and explained that she had manually inserted the animals inside her to make the delivery as realistic as possible. She was immediately imprisoned for fraud and the medical community was ridiculed for having been fooled. Starting us off at number 10, Moko Makai. Long before the interference of European colonists, the Maori people of New Zealand showcased status through a practice called tamoka, which are facial tattoos. These tattoos not only marked a rite of passage, but also signified rank, lineage, and occupation, and were a highly respected and sacred practice. Now, when someone with Moko passed away, either naturally or through battle, they would sever the head from the fallen body and preserve it by boiling it, smoking it, drying it out, and finally dipping it in shark oil. If the person had been killed by a warring tribe, it was kept as a trophy. However, in other cases, families would keep the heads of their fallen loved ones, treasuring them, and only bringing them out for sacred ceremonies. Now, the reason I say all of this is because at first glance, you kind of assume that this guy sitting in front of all these mummified heads was the one to have been responsible. But that's not the case. This man here, Major General Horatio Gordon Robley served with the British Army during the 1860s and was but one of the soldiers to pillage and steal the heads right out from under Maori people. Disgustingly, he then tried to sell the stolen artifacts 
back to the New Zealand government, however they ended up being displayed at the American Museum of Natural History instead. Coming in at number 9, Remains of an Astronaut. Infamously known as the man who fell from space, Vladimir Komarov was a famous Russian astronaut or cosmonaut as they were called during the Cold War space race. In 1967, he embarked on a crazy mission that although he was completely trained to complete, was ultimately rushed. Allegedly, the spacecraft had a multitude of structural issues, and despite engineers warning the Soviet officials that the craft was not ready, they continued with the mission as planned. So Vladimir took off and made his way up into the eternity of space, and even executed 16 orbits around Earth. But along the line, something went awry with his mission, so he was instructed to make his way back down to Earth. However, things went south upon trying to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere when his parachute would not engage, and Vladimir plummeted back towards the Earth, crashing in a horrific explosion. Rumor has it that while he was plummeting to his fate, he was screaming at the Soviets for forcing him to do this mission. All that remained of him is what you see here. Next up at number 8, Radium Girls. After its discovery in 1898, radium quickly became one of the hottest things on the market. By 1914, the United States Radium Corporation began developing a special glow-in-the-dark paint using radium, which was mainly used for watches they would send off to soldiers during the war. However, the corruption began after they started hiring young female workers to use said paint to make these radium dials, but despite having an understanding of the harm it could inflict, they did nothing to warn these women, nor did they provide them physical protection from the substance. In fact, they actually assured them that the paint was harmless, and more so instructed the women to make a point out of the brushes with their lips to keep the fine tip for the watches. So the women in each facility began unknowingly ingesting copious amounts of radium, and the process became known as lip dip paint. And some of the girls even began to paint their fingernails, face, and teeth with the stuff, as once again, they had been told it was completely harmless. However, as we know now, that was far from the case, and tragically, many of these radium girls, as they were later coined, either died from the exposure or at the very least suffered extensive poisoning. Tragically, little did the women in this photo know, they were already dying a slow and painful death. Number 7. Battle of Los Angeles Of course we have to mention one of the most unspeakable battles of all time on this list. The Battle of LA, otherwise known as the Great Los Angeles Air Raid, happened during World War II. It happened right at the end of February 1942. This event, first of all, took place only a few months after the Pearl Harbor attack, so everybody was obviously a little stressed out at this point. Something like 25 enemy aircraft was spotted, spotted, flying over LA in the late hours of February 24th, so air raids went off. Blackouts were now in effect. This was not a drill. Or was it? At this point, it didn't look like a drill. Artillery fire, machine guns, anti-aircraft shells were all going off. It was loud, it was bright, and in total, around 1,400 shells were fired off. Two people had heart attacks as is unfolded. Five people died in total from this retaliation, and it was all a false alarm, apparently. A press conference was held by the Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, and he called the incident war nerves. Eh, just some nerves, just some whoops, thought I heard something, eh, false alarm. This is insane. Do we think something was actually there? Is this photo a photo of a false alarm? You be the judge. That's why I'm here. Number six, Spaceman. Look, we've all been photobombed before. It's a blessing in disguise, right? You look back at prom photos, some guy sneezing in the background making a mess. It's the best. But when Jim Templeton took a photo of his daughter in an empty marsh long before Photoshop existed, might I add, it appears an astronaut photobombed the family moment. Yeah, Jim assures us that nobody was around, which I personally believe. Otherwise, what a weird photo to take in an otherwise empty field. I'd be like, hi, I don't want to be in this photo. It's weird, right? It makes it more believable. Kodak even got involved in the story, like the company Kodak. They confirmed this photo was not tampered with. Yeah, we're just gonna run everything by Kodak from now on. They were so confident when this happened. Spider-Man Elite, Kodak's like, that's Andrew Garfield. That's authentic, that's a real one. Number five, the Worstead Church. Okay, time to get a little paranormal. <laughs> we love those. Back in 1975, Peter and Diane Berthelot were visiting the Worstead Church in the UK. So like any other visitor does, Peter took a photo of his lovely wife sitting in the spectacle of a church. But later on, once said photo was developed, somebody else was in the photo. Another photo bomb. Or something. 
There appears to be a person dressed in all white sitting behind Diane, some sort of figure. How calming is that? Just maybe behind you at all times, who knows? When the couple went back to the same church to ask about who it was or what it was, a local suggested that they may have gotten proof, photo proof, of the white lady. The spirit of a healer who haunts the church. I mean, as far as surprise ghosts go, that's a pretty tame encounter. That's, that's how it should be, if anything. That's how I hope it goes. God forbid I ever encounter a spirit. Is there one behind me right now? I don't want to look. Number four, the Black Knight Satellite. Not to be confused with Martin Lawrence's The Black Knight, that's a pretty historical and memorable movie in itself. The Black Knight Satellite is something that has been orbiting our planet for thousands of years. Everything else in this list is quite recent, all things considered. This myth is an ancient one. This photo here you've probably seen at one point or another. It was taken back in 1998 during an American mission to the International Space Station. Apparently this guy has been hovering over Earth just watching, just observing us, some sort of alien satellite Satellite. That's the theory here. That's a fun theory, no doubt about it, but during a spacewalk in 1998, one of the thermal covers came loose and drifted away from the station. Could this just be that cover? It just looks sinister because it's in space and the photo just looks grainy. I don't know. These photos were originally shared by NASA and it looks a lot different than a solar sail, in my humble opinion. I'm voting alien satellite. I'm gonna lean into that one. I've been watching that one for a few years. I'm into it. Apparently the Illuminati shot it down back in 2015, but I don't know. That's just the internet being the internet. I was gonna throw that in, but I was like, eh, not enough info on it. So it's definitely a floating alien satellite. Number three, nursing home spirit. This photo was taken from a nursing home resident the same night another resident had sadly passed away. Good time to take photos and have memories, I guess. This was back in 2015. That night they heard a door open and close a few times, but there were no visitors allowed. So obviously something was afoot. So there's a great amount of people who think that this image here is one of two things. The spirit of said resident that had passed away or the Grim Reaper. That's scary. If it's one of them, I hope it's the first. The door opening and closing, people think that was the Grim Reaper coming in and doing his Grim Reaper thing and then leaving. That's so scary. I mean, a few comments are saying how it's comforting to know that in the end of your life, you aren't alone and that somebody greets you and, you know, escorts you to the afterlife. I'd rather die alone than have this dude break into my house, to be honest with you, but that's just my opinion. Either way, possible photo of a ghost or the Grim Reaper. How fun is that? Hit the thumbs up for the Grim Reaper. Let's hope we don't see him anytime soon, except for on this list. Number two, Norway lights. Natural light phenomena is common on our big, beautiful planet. The northern lights, for example, the green flash, we've mentioned that before on this channel. Solar eclipses, I bet those were alarming back in ancient times. Just gets dark for a minute and they're like, uh, hmm, what happened? Hello, on, please. Some of these natural events look otherworldly. They look cosmic. Most of the time, there's an explanation awaiting, but for the mysterious glowing orbs floating over Norway, the Hesdalen lights, as locals refer to them, well, we still need answers for those. Scientists have been trying to gather research for a while now, and in 2014, after many impressive light shows, their best guess so far is that it's a natural battery that charges underground. Yep, whatever that means. Whatever the hell that means. Maybe this has something to do with the reoccurring lights over Phoenix, Arizona. Maybe it's just aliens just bopping about, just doing their alien bopping thing, the usual bopping spots. And finally, Finally, number one, time traveler. Do you believe in time travel? If your answer is no, maybe this last one will change your mind. Hopefully, I'm from the future. It does. And you also hit that thumbs up. I've seen it in as many features. It's a common theme in movies. Back to the Future, Looper, Avengers Endgame. Time travel plots are fun, but they're absolute nonsense. But when we see a case like the Cape Scott story, we can't help but be intrigued just a little bit, right? Could it be? Possibly? <laughs> Rhyming a little bit? Could it be possibly? Time travel or not, this is an interesting photo. It's really, it sticks out. It comes from Ray Peterson's book, The Great Cape Scott Story, and that book was from 1974, but this actual photo was taken over a hundred years ago. And there's a modern looking guy in this photo. He looks like he was from yesterday. Rocking shorts, messy morning surfer hair, the thing I'm trying to do apparently in this video. Is that me? Is this my, like, my, my, my cousin? That's crazy. A photograph from the 40s seems to feature a modern man. Time travel confirmed. That's how we're ending this list. Boom. You're from the future. You saw this coming, right? Coming in at number 10 is Anne Frank's Attic. For those of you who don't know, Anne Frank was a German-born Jewish girl who kept a diary in which she documented life in hiding from 1942 to 1944 during the German occupation of the Netherlands in World War II. She wrote every day in her diary about her life from her family's hiding place in an Amsterdam attic. Her diary was eventually published and it's now one of the world's best-known books. Now this photo is not of Anne 
again, but of her father, Otto, in 1960, revisiting the attic where the family hid. He was the sole survivor of his family, so I can't imagine the pain he had revisiting this place. Later, the photographer Arnold Newman recalled taking this photo. He said, The mood was depressing, and I immediately began photographing him. After a few moments, the Wester Torn bells next door began to ring. Those were the bells that Anne wrote about. He suddenly broke down completely, weeping uncontrollably, and then so did I. We never met again. To this day, when I lecture or tell his story to people, I find I choke up. I still can't help myself. Number 9. An Inmate at the Rab Camp The Rab Camp was one of several Italian concentration camps, and it was established during World War II in July 1942 on the Italian-occupied island of Rab, now in Croatia. Estimates of the Commission for Determining the Crimes of the Occupiers say 4,641 detainees died at the camp, including 800 inmates who died while being transported from Rab to other concentration camps in Italy. In July 1943, after the fall of the fastest regimine in Italy, the camp was closed, but some of the remaining Jewish prisoners were deported by German forces to the extermination camps. Under Italian Army Commander Mario Rotata's watch, the ethnic cleansing and violence committed against the Slovene civilian population included summary executions, hostage taking and ending the hostages' lives, reprisals, and the burning of houses and villages. Slovenes and Croatians suffered from cold and hunger in open air tents, surrounded by barbed wire fence and guarded towers. At its peak, there were up to 15,000 internees. Conditions at the camp were described as a Falling, filthy, muddy, overcrowded, and swarming with insects. This photo just shows how much suffering they went through. Number 8. A Jail Cell from the Salem Witch Trials This makeshift jail cell truly brings out the horrors of the Salem Witch Trials. These trials were a series of hearings and prosecutions of people accused of witchcraft in colonial Massachusetts between February 1692 and May 1693. More than 200 people were accused, 30 people were found guilty, 19 of whom were executed by hanging. Now, women vastly outnumbered men in the ranks of accused and executed. It was in cells like this one that the accused witches spent their final moments before being executed. Now it's just sad because we all know that this was just a scare and that they weren't real witches. Many of these women were suspected and chosen because they were simply unliked. Coming in at number 7, Mary Reeser. On the morning of July 2nd, 1951, in St. Petersburg, Florida, Mary Reeser's landlady went up to the old woman's apartment to deliver a telegram. But upon her arrival, notice something strange. That her door was warm to the touch. Still, she opened it nervously, and to her horror, she found Mary almost completely reduced to a pile of ashes on her chair with only a small part of her left leg and her shockingly shrunken skull remaining. But what exactly happened to Mary? Well, that's kind of the million dollar question. Local authorities were unable to determine the cause of the fire as the rest of the apartment was relatively unscathed. And when the FBI became involved, they determined Mary had essentially gone up in flames like the wick of a candle while her own body fat fed the flame. But still, the question of how the fire started in the first place remained unanswered. Often referred to as the cinder lady, there was a theory at the time that Mary suffered spontaneous human combustion, but whatever it was that happened certainly left a terrifying crime scene. Coming in at number 6. 19th century cure for mental illness. Over the years, there have been countless terrible ideas related to the cure for mental illness. In the early to mid 1900s, for example, the lobotomy was a popular method to fix the issue. At other points in time, they believed removing a part of the skull could do the trick. Prior to this, it was common practice to generate a near death incident like drowning, while, of course, back before the idea of depression or other mental illnesses were truly understood as a concept, it was 
believed to be a demon, and a good old exorcism was the way to go. However, there is one practice I had never even heard of until I saw this photo from 1890. As you can see here, this photo shows a woman being held up in a sort of crucifix pose and forced to face a wall. And after doing a bit of deep diving, it turns out this was a pretty standard practice in mental institutions in the 19th century. At the time, it was believed that this could cure what they referred to as insanity, although I don't know how any of these people thought forcing someone to stand while being chained up and staring into nothingness was going to help them feel better. I mean, if I didn't know any better, I would think this was some kind of evil prisoner. Just goes to show how corrupt and cruel asylums were back in the day. Coming in at number 5, the last public guillotine. I don't know about you, but I am always shocked when I remember that the last public execution via guillotine was in 1939. It just feels so medieval that I can't believe there are people alive today who could have witnessed such a thing happen. The man facing his death was named Eugene Weidman, and to be fair, he was no peach. Convicted for kidnapping and killing multiple men and women, but even so, it's wild to me that this photo is less than 85 years old. According to news articles from the time, the crowd went wild when he was brought out of the prison and towards the giant blade. Observers were reportedly hooting, hollering, and whistling during the event, even going so far as to dab up the dead man's blood with their handkerchiefs as a souvenir. After the event, authorities decided that what had long been intended to serve as a deterrent for bad behavior had turned into a rowdy, gladiator type fest, and so France ultimately decided to outlaw public execution entirely. And speaking of people we know that witnessed such things, famous actor Christopher Lee, who played Saruman in Lord of the Rings, was apparently at this very execution. Coming in at number 4, Hotel Manager. At first glance, it's a bit tricky to tell what's going on in this photo. However, after doing a bit of searching around, the story behind it all is much darker than meets the eye. Taken during the civil rights movement of the 1960s, this image you are seeing here shows a group of both black and white folks enjoying a dip in the pool while the hotel manager is pouring some kind of liquid into the water. Now, before I get into what's happening in this photo, let me first explain what happened seven days prior. So remember, at this time, segregation was still in full swing, and this hotel was whites only. Reportedly, a week before this photo was taken, Martin Luther King Jr. was arrested for trespassing at this very hotel after being asked to leave from its segregated restaurant. Now, there were some people staying at this hotel who, rightfully so, thought this was not okay, and so the white guests invited black people to join them in the pool as their guests in an attempt to protest the segregation of the facility. However, the manager, Jimmy Brock, was not a fan of this protest, and in this photo here, you'll see he's pouring a bottle of hydrochloric acid into the pool to scare away the swimmers. Again, just another thing to add to the long list of atrocities committed to people of color in our world. In our number three spot today, we have bad politics. This is a photo that shows the former first lady, Rosalind Carter, and you may or may not be wondering who that man next to her is, and to that I say, my friends, that is the horrible, horrible monster that is John Wayne Gacy, aka the Killer Clown. This photo was taken at a Polish Constitution Day celebration in Chicago in 1978, which is the same year that Gacy was arrested for his crimes, so at the point this photo was taken, he had already taken the lives of at least 20 people. The reason he was there and was able to meet the First Lady is because he was not only the worst of the worst, he also somehow became the Democratic precinct captain in the Chicago suburbs in the 1970s, and he was the marshal of the Polish parade. The picture is even signed, quote, to John Gacy, best wishes, Rosalind Carter. It's terrible. I hate it so much. I feel very bad for anyone who had to meet him. In our number two spot today, we have the first day. This is a photo that shows Dorothy Count Scoggins as she joined her new school. What should be a perfectly normal activity was certainly anything but for Dorothy, as she was the first black person to attend Harding High School in Charlotte, North Carolina, which was previously an all-white school. After the passing of the Purcell Plan in 1956, there were 40 students who applied for transfers, and Dorothy was one of four who was accepted. This photo clearly shows that although 
although small steps were being taken within the law to prevent segregation, there were no steps being taken within the students. As Dorothy just tries to get an education, you can see her peers clearly trying to disturb her peace. After four days of this kind of treatment, Dorothy's parents ended up withdrawing her from the school over fears for her safety. These images, however, were seen around the world. This photo acts as quite the reminder for where we were really not all that long ago. In our number one spot today, we have the Challenger crew. This is a photo that was taken of the clearly very excited Challenger crew as they walked down the ramp ready to head off on their mission. The crew even included 37-year-old Krista McAuliffe, who was a high school social studies teacher. She had won a spot on this mission through a program with NASA called the Teacher in Space Program, and she had trained diligently for months in order to be the first non-military person in space. On January 28, 1986, the Challenger mission proved to be fateful just 73 seconds after liftoff. Two rubber O-rings failed because of the cold temperatures of the morning, and on live television, the world watched as the spacecraft broke apart and plunged into the ocean, sadly taking the lives of everyone on board. It is an absolutely tragic event made even more chilling by this final photo. Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the Mad This is a photo that was taken of someone known as the Mad his real name was George Metesky, and he was the man who terrorized New York City for 16 years while he planted explosives in public places like an absolute psychopath. I guess he was apparently angry about a workplace injury he had suffered in the years prior to his terrible crimes, so of course the normal reasonable jump to make would be not that. While no one should have ever had to suffer because of these crimes, the good news is that while he planted 33 and set off 22 of them, miraculously only 15 people ended up injured in the end. This photo of him behind bars is extremely eerie thanks to his creepy smile and haunting eyes. I might be the only one who feels it, but it just seems like something's off. You know? In our number 9 spot today, we have Ancient Preparations. This is a photo that isn't necessarily very old, but it's of some stuff that has been around for a lot longer than cameras have. These images were taken in the ancient city of Herxheim, which is located in Germany, and dates back to about 7,000 years ago. The photo shows some artifacts which, at a first glance, don't look too dark or creepy or weird, but just wait. Apparently, these artifacts and remains show clear signs of flesh stripping. Yeah, okay, wasn't expected. Expecting that one. Apparently, this was a process that was part of the preparation before consuming human flesh. So, yeah, maybe it is a pretty dark photo after all. I'm not exactly sure how all of these things were used or what exactly the process looks like, but I think that maybe that information might just be better left in the past. In our number eight spot today, we have the lone scientist. This is a photo that comes to us from shortly after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Many of us, of course, already know plenty about it, but if unfamiliar, in April of 1986, there was an explosion and fire from a nuclear reactor in the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. This explosion happened when there was an issue as they were trying to begin an experiment which was set out to actually make the reactor more safe. Unfortunately, the way this reactor was designed placed too much responsibility in the hands of the operator. One thing led to another and it was a huge disaster and went on to become one of the worst nuclear disasters in history. The amount of radiation in the air caused alarms at the Forsmark nuclear power plant in Sweden, which was over a thousand kilometers away, so it certainly wasn't anything to take lightly. That is exactly why why this photo of a lone scientist going down into the dark radioactive filled area near the meltdown is so terrifying to look at. It reminds us of the bravery of those who went to help after the disaster, and it also reminds us just how scary some of the things we have on this planet really are. In our number 7 spot today, we have the figures of the fire. This photo is both extremely unsettling and super captivating as it shows a scene after the great fire at Madame Tussauds in 1925. Of course, this wax museum is famous for the extremely lifelike wax figures that are created and find their home there, so you can only imagine the aftermath of a fire. These lifelike figures, but with missing heads and appendages, burnt skin and hair, and just clothing in disarray. Seeing this photo for the first time without knowing the story about it was definitely a bit of a confusing and terrifying experience. The heads on the ground really freaked me out for a full 5 seconds. As scary as it is, I'm just glad to hear that it's not real and just some creative 
casualties rather than what this photo appears to be at first. Next up at number six, Minnie Dean. Wilhelmina Dean, or Minnie as she was often referred to, was a nanny in New Zealand during 1880 and was a well known caretaker in her town. But something was off with the woman, and soon she began having quite the dark spot on her name and career. In 1889, one of the young people under her care suddenly died, as if out of nowhere, and initially it was viewed as a freak accident, but two years later, the same thing happened again. Now with two minors perished under her care, police decided to investigate further into the matter. After a bit of sleuthing, it was concluded that under Minnie's care, the two minors were as she was attempting to take out life insurance on them. Police immediately took the remaining young boy in her care, finding it in dirty clothes and drinking curdled milk. By 1895, the investigation into her crimes continued, and she was spotted trying to flee on a train with another victim in her arms. And when police searched her house, they found three more covered up victims. Eventually found guilty for all her crimes, she was the first and only woman ever hanged in New Zealand. Next up at number 5, Radiation Test Subject. In 1999, a man named Hisachi Uchi was a power plant technician and he became known for being exposed to the highest amount of radiation of any human in history. While working at the Tokamura nuclear power plant, after a lack of safety protocols, improper training, and just an overall pressure to meet deadlines, Uchi and his co-workers made a terrible error. They mistakenly mixed an incorrect measurement of radioactive materials into the wrong tank. And as you've probably figured out, it caused a near fatal burst of gamma rays. Hisashi, who happened to be the closest to the incident, was brutally injured and sent to the hospital. Once he was there, it was discovered he had no more white blood cells, so essentially meaning that he had no remaining immune system. And despite being in intense pain with a rapidly deteriorating condition, doctors kept him alive under the family's request. So for 83 days, Uchi remained alive, being used as a test subject for experimental radiation treatment by the doctors, which, I mean, in their defense was the request of the family, but still, he endured several cardiac arrests, lost all of his skin, and suffered brain damage as well as organ failure. One of the last things Uchi ever said was, quote, I can't take it anymore, I'm not a guinea pig. And then finally, one more cardiac arrest released him from his torture. Coming in at number four, Mamiya. Most widely practiced between the 12th to the 17th century, although there were a few cases in the 18th century that pop up, Mamiya was widely used as a means of medicine in many European countries. Now, if you can't tell by the name, Mamiya is creepily just as it sounds, the use of human remains to fix a living person's ailments. It was believed by many of the top physicians at the time that ingesting certain remains prompted the medicinal power of the mummy and could cure things like coagulated blood, pain, coughs, inflammation, cramps, and even heal open wounds. Now, they didn't just sit around eating the carcass directly. Instead, they would either grind the bones into a powder and drink it from there, or drink an extracted liquid from the embalmed individual. In fact, it was so popular at one point that it's believed the reason there are so few mummies these days is because of the high demand of flesh at the time. Moving on to number three, we have post-mortem photography. So back in the day, there was an interesting trend that people would follow which was post-mortem photography, aka taking photos with a person who was recently deceased. So the woman in the middle of this photo has sadly passed away. So they did this for a number of reasons. It was a way to deal with their grief. It helped preserve the image of the loved one that passed away, and it was also a little memento. This trend became common in Victorian England when there was a rise in short lifespans for the young, which is sad. And in a way, this is a sweet way to preserve the memory of a loved one. But it's creepy. Hella creepy, you have to admit it. Coming in at number two, we have the crucifixion. This creepy photo from 1890 Germany is of a woman who suffered from mental health issues. This was their method of treatment. They thought that this would cure her. Basically, they locked her in a cellar for 12 hours a day. For those 12 hours, she was changed up in the crucifixion pose. Apparently, this was supposed to cure her mental illness. 
Okay, I'm no psychologist or, you know, doctor, but that alone would drive me insane and make everything worse. Now, this was done for a number of reasons. They thought that when you make someone pretend to be crucified, they will think, well, good thing I'm not actually being crucified. Hey, my life isn't that bad. Bingo, problem solved. No, honey, no, it does not work like that, I'm sorry. And in our number one spot, we have the haunting photo. Ready to not be able to sleep tonight? Take a look at this photo. This is the creepiest thing I have ever seen. This is just a normal family photo taken back in the day, but the camera quality makes them all look like ghosts. I'm sorry, but that man is not human. He's like a zombie ghost. Those eyes, don't stare into them for too long or else he's going to possess you, I swear. Even the baby looks hella creepy. They literally look like a family of ghosts or demons. They're gonna haunt me in my dreams, I swear. Mm -hmm. 